Let's give them a welcoming round of applause. Thank you. Um, I thought I would just, in, in introducing the panel, just say briefly, Theatre Without Borders is a volunteer network. It's just like the ladies' sewing circle at your local library. <laughs> it's nothing more and nothing less. We have no office, no telephone, no funding, no funders, no money comes through. We wrote www.theaterwithoutborders.com, but we didn't know what com meant. We should have written org or net or something. So um, we really are literally just a grassroots group of volunteers. And you are welcome. We're hereby on the Theatre Without Borders. We welcome you. Um, so, um, I wanted to say that some of us wear many hats, many of you wear many hats, I do too. Um, I sit here as, um, uh, I work for the Sundance Institute Theatre Program. For 10 years we've been doing exchange with East Africa. We are starting to move north, which means to North Africa and to the Middle East. And uh, we just went back from a trip to Jordan, uh, where we're reaching out to do peer-to-peer artistic exchange and exposure between the United States and uh, uh, artists who uh, live in other countries. Um, I also sit here um, as um, uh, a co-founder um, of Theatre Without Borders, and because of that, um, a, um, a person very involved in something we call the Acting Together Project, and I just wanted to share that in relationship to what we're, what we're doing. Um, I have a quote to share, which has motivated a great deal of the work that we've been doing in East Africa and continues to motivate uh, the work in the Acting Together Project and uh, Fulbright, I'm a Fulbright ambassador, if you want. Fulbright is a program that um, uh, uh, is focused out of the United States State Department uh, to create exchange between uh, the United States and other countries. But one of those, th this is the motivating quote, and it comes from Aimé Césaire, who's a, a Martinique a poet and political theorist who was very involved in the creation of the Negritude movement. Uh, and this is what he said. It is a good thing to place different civilizations in contact with each other. That whatever its own particular genius may be, a civilization that withdraws into itself atrophy that for civilizations, exchange is oxygen. When I was having a conversation with Ngugi Watiango, who is one of the great uh, uh, thinkers, journalists, writers in Kenya, he quoted Emesia Zer. And then he said to me, but that only works when the two civilizations that meet each other meet as equal because otherwise the power differential can completely destroy that encounter. So he set up in my and uh, our imagination for the Sundance program <coughs> that the oxygen that one can gain from intercultural encounter can be both incredibly nurturing but also potentially explosive. And that if the meeting is not carefully and ethically reflected upon that there is danger as well as um, uh, potential uh, constructive impact. The Acting Together Project comes out of the Performance and Peace Building Program at Brandeis University, and Theatre Without Borders as a network of artists was adopted by Brandeis, which is based in Waltham, Massachusetts. And Roberto Borea, who is here and was part of the previous panel, is a co-editor of this book. It's a two-volume anthology of case studies around the world. There are 18 case studies in the two volumes of artists who are working uh, in conflict zones. There's a 55-minute documentary. And uh, as this says, acting together, join the conversation. It's a community of artists who are working in, within conflict zones, who are working within a cycle of violence, whether it's repression and resistance, whether it's rehumanization post-conflict, or whether it's reconciliation, and recognizing that that cycle of violence 
can include all those aspects. It's not necessarily in the fruition of violence, it can also be <clears throat> in a period of repression or occupation. And what, what do artists do in those contexts? What do artists do when there is violence in, in media? And what do artists do post a violent context and are trying to rehumanize and reconcile differences? So um, we, I have a little bit of slides to share. I'll, I'll just I ask for them to go quickly. Um, oh. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is Theater Without Borders. We welcome you, www.theaterwithanrewithoutborders.com. Our welcome. Going on. Uh, Toranj asked me to mention something that, that Theatre Without Borders has worked with Golden Thread Productions and with Hybrid Theatre Works on, and with David Diamond of La Mama uh, on. And we have been doing a Theatre in Conflict Zones presentations and exchanges with, with intentional emphasis on bringing people together who work in various conflicts. This is the Al Buga Theatre from the Sudan. They work in the Darfur region. They're made up of um, artists from over 100 ethnic communities in, um, in the Sudan. And uh, Ali Madi Nouri has created what he calls a theater of festivity, where the goal is to go into the Darfur region and actually create a party, <laughs> where by the end everyone is dancing together and singing. And we could go on. Slide three, go. Uh, we had a wonderful happy meal together. There's Taranj and me and my husband and Walid Shamil from University of Baghdad, Amir al azraki from University of Basra, Shafiq Nadim from uh, Ashoka Theater in Lahore, Pakistan, um, oops, from Yale School of Drama. Ali is a student at Yale School of Drama. My husband, me, and Serge, and we can go forward. We were having a meal together. In 2011, Golden <coughs> Productions of Theatre Without Borders brought Walid and Amir and uh, Shahid to the United States to attend the PCG conference. And we had an event. There's David who joined us. We can kind of just roll through these. Um, they attended the PCG conference. There's uh, Heather Rocco, who is the writer and performer of Nine Parts of Desire, a play about Iraqi women. Uh, post the war, and um, this is Katrine to you, another founder of Theater Without Borders. This is uh, uh, Walid actually got his PhD at UCLA, so he's there having a reunion with Michael Hackett, who is the chair of the theater program at UCLA, <laughs> and Michael Najjar, who is a graduate there, and uh, who's now teaching. This is a picture of the continuation of that project. Jessica was telling you that she was just in Basra at the University of Basra. These are photographs from her trip. So she's here with Amir. And the next four or five slides, here she is with one of her students, I think, yeah? Because you did a workshop with that. And this is the audience that attended. This was an Arab World University Theater Festival, and, and Jessica was invited to be a, a, one of the jury panel. Okay. And going on, there's Walid, there's Amir, And this, these are some friends in your hotel. <laughs> so we can keep going on. Um, the, the From Babylon to Hollywood is actually part of the original 2011 visit. This is Katherine Fiu, who went to a women's international uh, conference in Erbil, Sulaymaniyah, just this past week as well. And she's doing a presentation about the Africa project. And we can go forward. Here she is with some of the women who are part of this conference. It was created by Adelaide Garmiani, who is uh, Kurdish Iraqi, and who uh, created something called Art Roll. And his commitment is to do uh, exchange with Iraq, the UK, and the United States now. And uh, so that's Katrine, and um, you can see the meal. You can see Sarah Sundi, who is a director from New York, and uh, who was also one of the guests. And Sarah is doing the presentation. Part of her presentation. And this final thing is the Acting Together project again. Uh, uh, and that's the end of my slide. Okay, back to the panel slide. 
So um, I want to thank because really uh, what what does exist now is David has traveled. David uh, Diamond has traveled to Iraq to uh, Erbil, Suleimania, and I believe you invited Dr. Fadil Jaff to come back to the La Mama Umbria Symposium uh, in uh, in uh, Umbria, Italy, uh, and. Um, uh, Walid has been to Georgetown University. There were students from Baghdad University. So um, what we what we have been able to accomplish so far is just building up some relationships. And um, there are some university supporters that are helping to make that happen. And what our understanding is is that the U.S. Embassy is very excited now to apply more funding to cultural exchange. So. Useful or not, depending on whether or not people want to, to participate in U.S. embassy funding for their projects. Um, so things are beginning, and our thanks to Golden Thread for um, initiating that with us, and to Hybrid Theater Works for making that trip to New York possible. So um, our panel addresses um, the kind of work that artists are doing here in the United States, as well as internationally, to to create that oxygen when <coughs> cultures come together and meet. And they're going to share with us challenges as well as successes, um, reflections upon their work. And uh, we have some amazing case studies, so I'm, I'm excited to introduce them to you. So we're going to begin with Gugu Kayin. Gugu is an interdisciplinary artist. She does site-specific work. Her areas of interest are memory, identity, and culture. She was born in Cyprus. Her family fled the violence that, had, that was taking place there, and so she grew up in London. She's now living at the, in the US. She teaches at the University of Minnesota, and she teaches theater directing. And she's going to give us a case study about a project that she's in development, working on. Thank you, and uh, thank you so much for uh, allowing me to present and share my work with you. I am um, <clears throat> located in Minneapolis and uh, it feels so wonderful to be in a community of people who are talking about things that I'm passionate about. Can I have the first slide please? Great, oh nice. So um, I am just going to do a little bit of, uh, I'm going to talk about a, a project that I'm currently engaged in in Cyprus called SHIFT, uh, working with colleagues on the Greek side of the island, and uh, you probably don't know what I mean by that, some of you, so I'm going to have to back up a bit and share some history with you so you can understand that. But that's what I'm, I'm going to be focusing on later on. The project is in progress, so I feel very much in the mess of it, so uh, it's been quite a challenge to try and get my thoughts together to, to make a coherent presentation for you, and I'm going to probably end up with more questions than answers in this conversation, so please don't take notes and ask me questions. Anyway, um, so uh, backing up to the history, um, I am, uh, so the history, uh, behind me obviously is a map of Cyprus, and on the upper right hand side, um, you will see a, uh, another map with a, a, a line across it, and that's essentially the DMZ in Cyprus. Um, the DMZ was created in 1974. Uh, after Turkey invaded the island and illegally partitioned it. Um, it's important to note that Cyprus has been in a state of conflict uh, before 74, that in fact Cypriots have experienced some sort of war-related uh, war conflict for over 17 years. Uh, since the World War II, the islanders have struggled to control their own political destiny and violence has been an important factor in that struggle. Uh, the words to describe the nature of that violence vary depending on who you are and what you, and what you believe. Some of the, the words terrorism, resistance to occupation, intercultural warfare, military coup, civil war, ethnic cleansing, invasion, reoccupation, partition, propaganda, all of these words uh, are relevant to the Cypriot, Cypriot condition. Uh, as a territory, um, the island was occupied by the British from the late 19th century and it suffered from policies that emphasized ethnic control and cultural division. 
Um, these divisions ran deep into the cultural of islanders, so much so that when the British finally left in 1958, the islanders did not stop fighting. Fighting, they turned the guns uh, on each other. And uh, I have a British accent because I left the island, uh, as many people did in the uh, period of violence. Uh, next slide, please. So I create site-specific performance. Um, next slide. The uh, focus of my book is really around violence and its impact on landscapes and communities. Um, site-specific performance is, uh, the idea of it is that it's uh, artistic work tailored to uh, non-theatre locations. And I'm trying to bring the power of theatre out into non-theatre spaces. My training is in classic stage work, but uh, as my ethnic origins, uh, we didn't have theatre when I was growing up. I, I come from a, a, an uneducated uh, hill tribe, so to speak. So um, for us, theatre was a non event. So therefore, when I encountered theatricality, for me, it made more sense to leave the theatre, which seemed to be an elitist space. So I walked into non theatre sites to create, in order to create my own. Uh, next slide, please. So, I, uh, since 1998, I've been engaged in creating a body of work called Self Portrait. Next slide, please. And this work involves uh, stories about the war. This is our token number one, which was staged in Minneapolis. Next slide. The next one is the Orange Grove, and that was based on the migration and the population exchange that happened as a result of the violence in Cyprus. Next slide. And this is also Orange Grove. Next. And stories from the DMZ, which bring me right up to the current time. As I mentioned, the DMZ uh, partitions the island, and uh, there are areas of the DMZ which are very um, wide, and areas which are very narrow. And in 2003, the borders were opened, which allowed uh, people to go across parts of the island and actually visit those spaces that they had abandoned during the population exchange. Um, but back to the artwork for a moment. Um, can you please um, play or record for me? So Orange Grove, I'm just going to keep talking through this, there's no sound. Orange Grove was based on interviews. Uh, a lot of my work is based on collecting interviews from family members, from Cypriots, because part of the issue of uh, dislocation is memory. Um, the idea uh, of uh, memory and post-memory, in other words, inherited memory, uh, traumatized communities often experience this kind of hanging on to uh, an event that was clearly important, um, and then how that event gets passed on through generations. I was very young when I uh, left Cyprus, and my family did not speak of the violence. Uh, in fact, I, I, I felt the violence through their actions and through their indirect comments. So for me, the, the act of performance was to reclaim and understand my family's own responsibility and part of the violence. Um, Orange Grove was actually a work that focused on the migration. Um, my family migrated from one side of the island, from the southern side, where we originate, to the northern side in order to, uh, in order to survive. And then we ended up migrating from the northern side to England in order to survive. Um, the, uh, the exchange itself, there are many stories about um, suffering because of the population exchange, but there are many stories about abandoning spaces uh, because of the population exchange. Part of cited work involves a, uh, a engaged research into the location in which the work will be tailored. This particular location is in Minneapolis, and it's in a uh, bomb site manufacturing complex, mm -hmm. um, which is located in Minneapolis. Now, the interesting part about um, locating work that's about one part of the world in another part of the world is that you discover links and connections to violence through that research. So Minneapolis has a strong history of developing sophisticated weaponry, which end up in parts of the world such as the Middle East. And for me, it was an attempt to return back to the American community some aspect of violence um, that they were responsible for. And, in, and 
start a conversation. Can you stop the video, please? Um, moving forward, uh, so in terms of the field research, uh, can you can you move one forward, please? I returned to Cyprus in, in 2005 after the borders were opened in order to re-engage with my family's history. Um, I went to the DMZ, and this is in the area of Barusha, uh, where I was born. And this entire area is actually in, within the DMZ. Next slide. Uh, I also went to my home village on the Greek side and uh, uh, went to those areas where my family's stories were from to discover that um, our village was being used by the British military base, which is over the valley there, as a uh, target practice. Um, there are still bases on the island that are owned by the US and uh, British military. And uh, so some of these abandoned spaces end up being places where strategic um, targeting happened. Next slide. I also visited uh, sites on the Turkish side that were abandoned by the Greek community. Many of these sites kind of call uh, to us because they remain unresolved. Uh, some of the work that I do engages with cultural geographers um, and uh, with people who are working in the area of social, social work and cultural geography. And we engage in this kind of um, uh, investigation of landscape and an understanding that empty buildings such as the one behind me uh, are buildings that, that are unresolved because the narratives cannot be resolved behind them. The decisions can't be made to move them forward. And that's sort of how I think about um, the issues that are psychic within conflicted communities, that our narratives are not resolved. So therefore, it's very hard for these communities to move forward and engage in a, in a vision of what could be in the future. Next slide. This is an image from the DMZ itself. Um, I ended up inside the DMZ because I happened to meet the Association for Historical Dialogue and Research. Um, as my research involved interviews, I also happened to then uh, encounter a group which were doing the same thing. Uh, the AHDR is an uh, NGO that's working within the DMZ with UN support, and their work is engaged in collecting stories and memories from both sides of the island in order to find a way in which to resolve the, the conflict. Um, because of our division on the island, uh, the narratives that exist on either side are in conflict. Um, I have found that the Turkish side focuses on a particular period of history, which is 63 to 74, which was a time of great um, suffering for the Turkish community. Uh, the term ethnic cleansing started on the island because the, the community itself was being encroached upon by the majority. Um, and uh, so the political infrastructure uses this narrative in order to justify the, the mainland Turkish occupation, to say that um, mainland Turkey is here to protect us from the uh, criminals across the way there, so we want to keep this division. On the Greek side, the focus is on the period post-1974 and onwards, because when Turkey invaded the island, um, they inflicted, the military inflicted its own um, violence and some of the Turkish community joined in with that violence also. So many were disappeared as a result of that. And so the Greek dialogue is um, everything was fine and then Turkey invaded and we suffered. So that's the dialogue, that ha the narrative that continues on the Greek side. The effort of the AHDR is to actually um, look at multi-perspectives in history to understand that we can, ha we can be suffering, we can be communities that have experienced violence, but we can also own the violence which we have inflicted on others. So the AHDR attempts to bring balance to that conversation. They do that by training teachers to re-educate history. So what am I doing with them? Um, next slide, please. I'm gonna stay on that for a while. That's an airport behind the DMZ. The HDR has developed a home in, in um, the DMZ. Instead of treating it as a, as a problem, they're looking at the DMZ as an asset. What they've done is renovated a house.
Cyprus that happen to be owned by Armenian Cypriots, uh, and they have uh, called it the Home for Cooperation. The Turkish side of the division is actually illegal, so it has no international standing, which means that it's very hard for anyone on the Greek side to engage with the Turks in any kind of constructive or legal dialogue. So the Home for Cooperation is an attempt to um, have discussions under the guise of neutrality, because the DMZ is a liminal zone. It's a zone that is empty, it, is, it has no status, the UN currently has uh, troops monitoring the DMZ, but essentially nothing happens. It's held in time since 1974. One of the things I like to talk about is car showrooms filled with cars from 1974. <laughs> sit there covered in dust. People's newspapers uh, sit there with 1974 news on it. And so piles, so this kind of warfare doesn't exist or is it, it doesn't exist as much as it used to, I guess. Um, so anyway, um, the attempt that I'm uh, working at in the DMZ is to collaborate with the HDR and engage with the Home for Cooperation to, uh, to work with artists from both sides of the division. I have met um, theatre artists from the Greek side and the Turkish side willing to engage in a dialogue. Um, the Rooftops Theatre, led by Elada Evangelou, and uh, the Municipal Theatre of Nicosia, uh, led by um, Alie Unamel, um, are willing to talk with me. So when I arrived in 2011 to witness the opening for the Home for Cooperation, we began a dialogue. Um, and these two artists had never met each other. My arrival allowed them to do that. We uh, have been having a correspondence online for over a year, trying to understand how we are going to work with each other. And I have to emphasize, that's actually quite tough. <laughs> I arrived on the island thinking that I was going to make a collaborative performance, much like the work that I had done in the past that's based on interviews. And I was quickly slapped awake by my collaborators uh, to realize that the state of propaganda within which they live in this kind of cold war makes it impossible for them to imagine collaboration with me, let alone with each other. So therefore, we had to back up. We had to decide um, how are we going to move this forward. And one of the resolutions we recently came up with is we're simply going to occupy the home for cooperation for a short period of time and show each other what we've got. In other words, we're going to show each other what, what are you doing in theatre? What are you doing theatrically? We're trying to use theatre as a neutral territory in order just to be in the room together. Because for Cypriots, it's very hard to be in the room together since our, our pasts really influence our presence. We cannot seem to have a dialogue because the language itself gets in the way. Whether you're calling the period terrorism or whether you're calling it a freedom struggle makes it almost impossible to have a conversation. Um, Alright, so, cited practice in the DMZ, what does that mean? I have to say that I don't know. I'm still trying to find out. I have learned that, um, that I, there's another aspect to this, which is the diaspora that I come from. Uh, I have the privilege of coming in and out of the discussion. Uh, I have learned that uh, do no harm is very important within these contexts because I have witnessed artists that have done work that have done harm because it's been used by one side or the other to justify the division. And I have learned that theatre practice above all does allow people to engage in some kind of common understanding regardless of the context within which we find ourselves. And I'm going to leave you with the next slide and the MP3 that I heard. Thank you. The, this MP3 is uh, based on some interviews I did with artists um, while I was in Cyprus. It just gives you a little taste of some of the work that I hope will come out of this collaboration. Talebeler, Türkler, Türk, evet talebeler. Müsesi, mümkünsün, 
Çünkü onların üzerine bile şimdi Ruhlar Şimdi Has no pardon me that can forgive a crime against humanity Not Turkish or Greek or anybody It's a crime against humanity You understand that? It didn't even To be honest when I started working on it It didn't even bother me which community they came from You know what? Yes. 
is uh, <laughs> our next speaker is going to talk about some lessons learned. Um, Andrew Wood is the executive director and the founder of the San Francisco International Arts Festival. And um, he is going to share an overview of some of the intercultural exchanges that he's helped present and uh, facilitate here in San Francisco. Hello. Um, first, I should um, say that uh, Roberta brought things into kind of relief for me when she said, uh, about if she mentioned the Theatre Communications Group. We're not members of PCG, we're members of the Association of Performing Arts Presenters, APAC, the Evil Empire. Um, so <laughs> we're, we, I'm not going to focus on the philosophy or the, or the politics or anything that everybody else is talking about. We're talking about economics and the logistics of making projects work. Um, there's three things we do in the San Francisco International Arts Festival, predominantly we have three curatorial priorities. The first, and one that we'll be talking about mainly today, but almost exclusively today, is we do projects with Bay Area artists that will collaborate internationally. We also present artists from the parts of the world on a shared stage with, the, with local artists. And the other thing we do is we present artists who usually do not have US representation from other parts of the world. So often it's the first time they've been in this country, and it's the first time they've been presented to an American audience. Those are the three things that we kind of, we kind of do. Um, and the reason for the first one, the one that I'll be focusing on, is that the Bay Area is it's kind of not just exclusive to the Bay Area, but we've seen we were a very good um, incubator place. A lot of the young people come here wanting to be artists, and they learn a lot about the craft of being a professional artist. And they get to a certain point of their career, and they wonder what they're going to do next. And a lot of the time, they leave. So what we try and do is work with them. And the other thing we should point out is that artists are journey a lot of the time. Not always, but a lot of artists travel around the world to gain experience, to meet other people. And there's loads and loads of times where someone says, oh, we should work together. They meet somebody in wherever it is they are. We should work together. We should do that. And they will exchange business cards. And nothing ever happens. So what we're trying to do is develop projects with artists who want to work cross-culturally with people from other parts of the world. And there's very practical reasons for wanting to do that. Um, again, in San Francisco, a lot of the time, we'll put up a piece of work if it's theatre, it's three or four weeks. If it's dance, it's one or two weeks. And then you never do it again. You know, you, you'll, put, you'll work for one or two years on, on putting this piece together, and then once it's done, it's done. There's no more money for it. They've never seen it. So what we try and do is work with artists from other countries and San Francisco, so at least a piece can be presented in San Francisco and that country. And we can also, in the, in the best case scenario, we try to make it so that money can be raised in that other country as well. In fact, a lot of the time, you know, Americans always complain about how much money there is in Europe and Japan. And I said, why do you stop complaining and go and get some of it? That's kind of what we try and do, is try to set up relationships where that can happen, set up situations where that can happen, where there's more money coming in so that the peace can be created and everyone can get paid for it. And then, knowing that there might be more earned income opportunities, but those earned income opportunities are going to happen somewhere else rather than here. It's basically, how do you make San Francisco or the Bay Area your home, knowing that a lot of the time you're not going to derive an income from being here unless you're supplementing the teaching or doing something else. So that's kind of what we do. Um, and things to know about international collaborations, um, they are a choice. It's not mandatory. You don't have to be an international collaborator much if you don't want to. Your work could be based exclusively here. That's great as well. Um, what we do when we talk to artists is always the why do you want to do this? And the why for me is, where is this going to take you? What are you going to know about yourself and your career after you've been through this project or this process? And the reason I ask that is because these things take a long time. They're very expensive. Half the time they don't work. You could, <laughs> you could spend two or three years of your life, your professional life, working on something that doesn't come to fruition or has a bad outcome. And so what? What, what's the stake? What, what's in it for you to want to try and accomplish this? And if you can't answer that question, it's, you know, it's really a non-start and you don't really, there's, no, there's no real basis for wanting to do the work. Um, and then the other thing about these is we have, you have to be able to anticipate change or be open to change because a lot of the time the projects kind of meander in different directions than you expected them to and just being able to go with the flow. Um, I say a lot of times they don't work. And we, what we like, what we prefer, is that the artists make the connections. 
it's my, for as a presenter. If I'm in the business of putting artists together, if something goes wrong, it's my fault. And I don't want that to happen. I want the artists to be your own responsibility for the work and then bring the relationship to me. So that's, that's what I'm saying. When you're going out in the world and you're extending your business card, you think there's somebody that you want to work with and you really want to try that. That's great because that means you're on board with it and you're not being told to do something by the administrator who thinks this is just really would be a cool idea. Uh, so there's that. Um, it is preferable if there are institutional partners in both countries or all countries. There are instances where certainly the discussions that we've had today and probably yesterday mean that in some of the countries that ain't possible. It isn't going to happen. Um, and that's, that's okay as well. You know, we can work around that. But it's, it's preferential if there's a potential to raise money in both countries or in all countries. And the other thing is that it's unique. There's no, there's no kind of formulaic approach to this. There's no one way that will work for somebody, we definitely work for somebody else. And again, it's just being open to change, being open to ideas, being open to, to, to figuring out things, sometimes as you go along. But there's one, there is one thing that, um, that we do that, that is required, and that there needs to be trust and understanding between all the protagonists, between the producers, between the commissioners, between the artists. If you're in a game where nobody really knows what the other side is doing and not being able to trust each other, then it makes it much, much more difficult to do the work. Not impossible, but much, much more difficult. And these things are already logistically difficult in the first place, just by the nature of what they are, by the by proximity, by, I mean, communications have become far, far more easier over the last few years than they used to be, but it's difficult traversing time differences, hundreds of thousands of miles, hundreds or thousands of miles. So not having everybody on the same page in terms of trust makes it far more difficult. And there has to be a willingness to acknowledge and, rec and respect the differences in culture, practice, and approach. If you go into it thinking our way is the way and we will teach them, you are almost certainly doomed to fail. There's really, that can't, that can't really happen. So what I'm going to do is just uh, you know, go over some projects. And I've, got, I've prepared far more slides than I have time to, so, to do. So I'm just going to skip some up, skip over some. But the first one, and this is really the this was really the, um, the idea for the festival of painting. This, this happened before the San Francisco International Arts Festival. This happened when I was still the director of ODC theater. Uh, Jess Curtis, who was first while a member of the group Contraband in the 1980s and 1990s, he had been traveling around Europe, and he came back from Germany saying, I want to work with this company called Company Fabric from Potsdam to create this pizza. And he said, can you help? I said, sure, we'll, 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 we'll co-commission. So, there was Potsdam, the Fabri Potsdam, there was Artbau, Artbau, Artbau and Braunschweig, and there was, there was ODC Theatre. And I raised about $25,000, the Germans raised about $45,000. And that's not a whole lot of money, but it was enough to make the peace and community in San Francisco and in Potsdam, which we did. But then Jess took that piece to the Edinburgh Festival, the Festival Fringe. And for those of you who don't know, it is a doggy dog place. There's a thousand different performing arts companies all battling it out on the fringe. And, you know, anything goes. But Jess and Fabrique got a fringe first, one of 12 companies that did. That piece was then performed, toured over a hundred times in eight different countries. And I just thought, there's a lesson to be learned here. I wasn't quite sure what it was, but there was a lesson to be learned here. And so we thought, this is how we can maybe think about how we create those conditions, which I said at the beginning. How do we create opportunities for our people outside of here so that they, they can continue to live here? And at the time, Jess was an individual artist. He had no resources of his own. And it was how do we create a relationship that can allow him to work in both countries or in, in both continents, in, in Europe and in the United States? And so we, as, we, as we began the festival, we started looking for existing relationships like that. So this next one is uh, Shinichi Ayoba Koga of Inkbox. He's performing with, um, with uh, Doe Theatre from Russia. And again, this is something that Shinichi had created. He was a journeyman. He was one of those people that just traveled around the world making projects and moving on, where, wherever the next paycheck was, basically. Mm -hmm. how he, did. he was creating collaborators, but again, he was an individual, and there was, he had no real resources to be able to, if you will, determine his own destiny. The journeyman part was out of necessity as much as anything else. It was also a great learning curve for him and a great experiential thing. But it was also how the order of business was, was such that you move where the money is. 
But again, it's how do, you, how do we create an environment where he can live here knowing that he can be working somewhere else a lot of the time. And so by the time we got to 2005, also, Jess Curtis, by this time, we helped him, uh, assisted him become his own 501c3, and he had his own offices in Berlin and in San Francisco. And Jess continues to work within this model. So he spent part of the year in Berlin, he's funded by the Germans, he spends part of his year in San Francisco, he's funded by the Americans. And he does these cross-cultural collaborations, mainly with artists from Europe, that allow him to take the work around Europe and the United States and create and create those opportunities for him to pay his artists to keep all these people on board. Uh, this was touched uh, symptoms of being human, which was actually far less successful than Fallen was. But uh, just to show you, know, not everything can be great, but it was uh, it was still a, it was a performance that uh, we raised with Jess about a hundred thousand dollars, put that together, and we lived to with more of the Europe and form of these in Europe and and the United States. <coughs> Continuing the German theme, this is Mr. Friedo Weiss. He is uh, an engineer who makes these amazing light shows and technology. And we've run a Friedo is here because we've worked with him on three different occasions with two different San Francisco artists. Both involved in 2005 and 2008, and Amy Silas imagery in 2010. And Frida and Amy are now talking about another project that will happen. We're so thinking probably 2014, 2015. It's going to be a site-specific project of what they want to do, and there has to be money raised for that. Uh, and Amy is known one of those artists who's gone through the process, as, as is early, they've gone through the process of being individuals to becoming 501c3 organizations, so that they actually have the capacity to, uh, to earn money and, and raise money themselves without us having to be the ones that do it for them. And the other thing, which I should have pointed out at the beginning when I forgot, is that these projects take a long time. Like I say, it's about three years between, fruition, between conception and fruition, sometimes longer. And it takes between two and five different non-profit organizations to raise the money. Um, you know, it's horses for courses, basically. And, and in this country, you could usually go to one foundation for one thing a year. So what we do is we line up different organizations so that there's always somebody, every time there's a grant deadline, we have a horse in the race. Right? And you might only get the money half the time. And that's what usually happens, is that for all the reasons that things don't happen, most of it is financial. You know, we'll start off with 20 projects, by the time we get to the end of the, end of the race, there's only 10 of them left. And some of them have been because of artistic differences, some of them have been for other reasons, but a lot of them it's just we haven't raised the money. Or the project gets down the road another year because we start to raise more money. And again, that becomes the, it's, um, it goes back to the question, why do you want to do this? Because it's very uncertain, it takes a long time. Andrew, mm -hmm. so, so people are, um, you receive proposals from the get-go. Someone yeah. will come in to you with an idea, like in the year in this audience, to come in and say, okay, there's a company in Iran, there's a company in Syria, there's a company in, and I want to, I'm an artist, I'm motivated, and I'm doing a project um, uh, in, in Cyprus. And she would uh, make a proposal to you, and you would consider the, the range of proposals, and then um, you work as a producer as well as we do a little range of things. There's, a, there's a only a certain amount of liability we can take as an organization. Uh, different artists, and again, this is why we're talking about creating 501c3s so that artist has the ability to raise money themselves without a business sponsor. They actually be more in control of raising the money, and we can raise the money with them. Um, and again, different artists require different levels of interaction with us. If, if you have no infrastructure, then it requires a lot from our side. If you have your own non-profit organization, you have your own staff, then you don't have to get those the young people that get to this. So this one, um, this one is um, Abadat Capoeira. The, their reason was for partnering with their parent organization was because the grants of the art wouldn't give them any money. Abadat, as far as grants of the art were concerned, we were a school. They were not for a legitimate presenting or artistic organization. So in this very room, as it happens, on this stage, we brought their parent company from Brazil, and with Grants of the Arts sitting in an audience of 300 people screaming and screaming, they performed their show within three months they were funded on Grants of the Arts last time they've been on there ever since. Um, I'll skip over this one. Um, this is, uh, I'm sorry, I think I've just run out of time. Well, I'm sorry. it's partly because we started. Oh, that's all right. We'll end there. Oh, thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you very much for showing.
know, I mean, the, the contrast between Google and here, you are an artist of passion, you're doing this because it's your life's work to, to address this particular place, and you're helping us and to understand that if the artist brings that passion, and yet there's still a whole series of very practical steps to get that passion. There's a lot. And I have to say that everything you've said, I completely have experienced the length of time, the, the, the agility you need, and the openness. The uh, <coughs> thing that you thought you were going to do isn't what you thought you were going to do. That is all the experience of putting things, not just in, I mean, that, that's an international experience. This is also a, a war zone. Mm -hmm. And then we have the added layer in my situation of an invisible <coughs> territory, which has no fun. You can't fund the Turkey side. I've tried to get funding to go, but it doesn't exist. I'm going to fall in the ocean, you know. So, so you know, there, are, there, are, there are elements to uh, international work that you, know, you have to deal with political situation. Yeah. And you have to get skills that are nothing to do with art. Mm. Right, right. Um, so I'm going to move now to our next speaker. And um, to take from what you said, uh, Henry, that, that the artist has to bring life's passion, has to bring this, this uh, tenacity and perseverance to make sure that this happens. So there's a motivating force within the artist. And I think both of our next two speakers are, are have life work that, that expresses this passion. So our next speaker is Idris Cooper. She's a director, a performer, um, and part of the Artistic Advisory Board at Brava. She is um, going to talk to us about the experience of directing inside of, as she called it, persistently white universities. And uh, her example is American Mall. Thank you. Um, I guess I, yeah, I'm bringing it home a bit. And uh, it seems a little funny that I have to say that my conflict areas are Indiana and Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think you, if you know, it seems like you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> so, um, and it could be subtitled how I got thrown out. Because I would say that there, you know, as I was listening to the previous panel and to uh, the group speak, I realized that, you know, I thought, well, what do I have if there's not a real danger? My life was not threatened. Uh, if, at least I didn't you know. I may be bringing a certain naivete in Indiana in particular. But um, it seems to me that in the context of, of the future, of this idea of how, how you deal with the post-trauma, what happens when you're post-violence and post-trauma, post-racial, as it were, and, and you want to speak to those concerns, you still feel uh, a necessity or in a position that uh, you are still not somehow in uh, a zone where you can speak freely. Um, so I was at Naropa University, which is a Buddhist institution in Colorado, with a local choreographer, Pearl Bungan, and we were thrown out of there. And then I went to Indiana University and proceeded to do so the same thing that I did at Naropa, which surprisingly, got me thrown out of there as well. So I wanted to speak to how that happened. So uh, at Naropa, we were, we were um, women of color, uh, Mara Tabor Smith, a local choreographer. There were some uh, people brought from Guinea and from Ghana to teach African dance. We were basically teaching non-white practices, non-European performance practices to mostly what we thought were white students. Um, and in both uh, situations, part of the issue was that when we ended the program, and uh, both times my work was anti-racist, that we were, Naropa called it browning the students. Mm -hmm. And I said, what is browning? And they said, well, they walk into your classroom white people. And they walk out and they're Italian and they're uh, Colombian and they're Haitian. And, you know, suddenly, so this is uh, some, I'm curious as to what is threatening about that still, but here I sit before you having lost two jobs as a result of Brown and Spirit. Um, so in both, in both uh, places I worked with American Mall, which is a, a satire about slavery by Robert O'Hara, and subsequently worked with Parentheses of Blood, Sonny Labutansi is a Congolese writer. And I would say that uh, in the case of Sonny Labutansi's work, I worked completely without any Congolese 
oversight advice. I was working under advisement of very small advisement of Judith Miller at NYU who had done in and helped with the translation of the play. And uh, the result of parentheses in Indiana was that one of Sony Labu, several of Sony Labutanti's friends and supporters came to the end and said, yeah, this was a good interpretation of the work. But I would say that I went into it because I wanted to experience it and I had no idea what Congolese theater was like and I wanted to, to actually see if I could unlock this translation of Congolese work um, despite the fact that there were no Congolese people available for me to speak to. But I want to focus on American Mall, which is an American play, a satire about slavery. Um, and I chose this play because I wanted, in Indiana in particular, to have a conversation with the students on race and uh, culture, gender, and sexuality that I saw uh, not being talked about in, in very dangerous ways not being talked about. There were lots of stereotypes being put on the stage unquestioned, lots of representations that were going unquestioned. And I realized the students not only didn't have the capacity to understand this, probably because there was no conversation around any of these issues happening in the theater department, despite the fact that Indiana has a wonderful gender studies program and a pretty strong history in African American studies program. But in the theater department, no one, of course, was talking about this. Um, and later, my goal became to smash what I call hierarchical parad paradigms that plague the theater that uh, if you want to look at like the director actor paradigm, that kind of thing. And, and really uh, dispense with that as, 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 uh, as an oppressive measure and to find new ways of collaborating with students that didn't reify those oppressive paradigms. I was very aware of not wanting to reify anything oppressive in these places because that was the norm. And so I wanted to make sure that I smashed, smashed, smashed. My fear always is that in America, theater is so defamed in a way that we can never produce theater that will get us in trouble. So uh, one of my goals, I suppose, has been to produce the theater that will get me locked up. And so uh, going to Indiana was a start. So American Mall, just uh, the, the premise of American Mall is that the president to absolve an economic crisis asked black people to visit slavery once again, this time a little bit better, and maybe there'll be some wages passed on, but uh, there was a new cotton invented by Eli Whitney V, and uh, this needed to be hand-picked, and since black people sort of had that in their DNA, the president felt like maybe we could start there with the black people returning to the plantations down south, deep down, to get the picket. And like taxes, it wasn't mandatory. You were asked to do this, but there were dire consequences if you didn't, with like taxes. And like taxes, there were some exemptions, one of them being, if you could prove you had enough presidential wife, you were descended from a Jefferson or a Washington or a Lincoln, then you could be exempt from going way down south to pick. Um, the women went first, and the men, uh, the men went first, and the women were to follow. So that gives you a little overview of, of the structure of the play, of the plot of the play. And it's told from two families, the Franklins, which is a white family, and the Jeffersons who live next door to the Franklins, <laughs> who all get along quite wonderfully until the president's edict comes out and then they turn on each other. So the play, uh, which was commissioned by ACT, and I was Robert's assistant for the original production at ACT, um, is a, has a way of addressing the tenuous relations between um, people, racial relations in, a, in the United States uh, through the lens of farcical comedy. Um, so to put on a farce about uh, slavery seemed appealing to the administration, although I am convinced they did not actually read the play. I said, let's do a farce about slavery. They said, okay. And then we started to rehearse and we got all this pushback. Um, Bloomington, Indiana is about 20 minutes from the Klan headquarters today. And uh, while I personally wasn't in any, any danger because I'm in the theater department, there were, both in Colorado and in Indiana while I was there, there was a lot of racial violence taking place. And a colleague of mine was uh, stabbed eight times in Indiana, and uh, several people were spit on and beat up in Colorado when I was there. So there was, there was a level of uh, racial violence that 
existed outside of the theater department that the theater department was not really willing or able to look at. And so I wanted to begin this conversation with the students. I felt a need to begin. Several students of color, the two or three that were there, had begun to talk to me about a lack of opportunities, and this play has 42 characters. So I saw a way to really populate the play with, with both uh, the people of color who left out and the misfits, the people who were not being cast. And so I started with uh, the audition process by dispensing with the, um, the hierarchy of auditioning. And this is this, in Indiana, they dress up in their Sunday dress and they come and they give you a classical monologue. So I asked everybody to bring Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech and send it up through a cartoon character or some kind of character that just would be funny. This was done to give permission for us to laugh at race. We needed permission to be able to, I'm black in the room, the students are white, they needed permission to open up their minds to the fact that we're going to be funny about racial horror in, in this uh, play. So I ended up uh, with uh, probably five times as many students as normally audition. I think the word got around that I was looking for the misfits and I was going to cast the uncastable. And so um, the first red mark I got from the administration was your audition went until 1 a.m. And so we had students lying down the hallway, and I mean, we had a student, a male student, show up in a fur with red lipstick and glittery high heel shoes on, so they came out for it. And so the costume designer and I, who were in the audition process, decided that everybody who was funny, thank you, that everyone who was funny would get cast. So we went from a cast of 15 to a cast of 30, another red mark, uh, disrupting the, the typical processes of the production process. So we ended up with a cast of 30, which meant we had to costume by size, and we couldn't sort of cast this guy as the postman until we figured out if we had a postman's uniform to fit. So that's another disruption of what is typically done in the theater. So we went into the process this way. Um, I recluse myself from being the directorial dictator, and the students staged each scene at least three times, and as a cast, we chose bits and pieces from each stage, and sometimes the stage in itself, and as a cast, we decided what the characterizations were going to be. So as we rehearsed it, whoever had been in one of those was in the room, we'd rehearse it one time through, and then the second time through, we'd rehearse it with someone else, until eventually the cast decided, you make a great Jefferson, you've done it three times in rehearsal. So the casting came really late in the process, um, requiring that the costume designer sort of switch it around. If we don't have a costume to fit Jeff, so can Steve be the postman instead? Can you play Thomas Jefferson instead? So this was very, very disconcerting to the administration of the university. And they were really mad that we weren't just following the rules. And so I had, you know, but I had everybody behind my back. And the designers were asked to defy their professors, and we came up with this really great piece of work. And I just want to speak about three things that happened as a result of this that I think are really um, the possibilities, the potential of the democratic process of theater. One was that we had to create a slave scene. It opens with Thomas Jefferson, the forefathers, creating the Constitution while slaves put cotton underneath them. And they're having trouble with that little thing about all men being free. <laughs> can't say free. And there's another point in the theater where Lincoln is trying to do his speech, and every time he says, free. He has to jump because a bullet comes out his head. <laughs> so I said, okay, who's going to be my slave? All the black people, you know your slave. So get on down on the floor. <laughs> okay, uh, who is identifying? Else is non-white. Yeah, you with the big afro and your Filipino, get on down on that floor, you're a slave to <laughs> Okay, who else is going to be my slave? Uh, I think, is anyone in here gay identified? Get on down on your slave. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and women, there were a couple women who said, uh, as a woman, I'm a slave. <laughs> so we ended up with, these, with people who had chosen to understand slavery through their own, um, through their own lives and ended up uh, as slaves in the play, finally. Um, and then we had a couple of scenes where we had the, uh, Ruth was a character in the play who was kind of like an Oprah figure uh, in drag, played by one of the football stars of the football team. We had one of the stars of the football team in drag. Another red mark. Um, and they had to, they were up against these Christians. And so the guy who showed up in the red lipstick and the high heel shoes, who was very out, 
he jumps up and says, I'll be the one of the gay couple. And then someone says, I'll be gay with you. Similar to the people who said, I'll be slaves with you. So we had uh, many, many instances of this uh, identification where we began to the, dissolve the boundaries and find ways that we were all involved in this institution of slavery and its aftermath. And I would say that one last thing I want to say is that one of the tactics I used was to make the cast as angry as I was. So anger played a large part of that. I told them that the audience was, uh, you're a cage lion and the audience is your prey. Eat those motherfuckers alive. <laughs> and then I showed them, we watched the corporation, which pissed them off royally. We watched a couple of Michael Moore films, which were all, this was all the information to these students. And then we watched Paul Mooney. So I got the good and wild up. And then we took over the building. We took over the building. And we started to play from the front door to the back door. So the, the audience had no escape. And people were forced to walk out of the play and cross right across the playing stage to walk out of the play. And as they were walking out, there were people still playing as they walked out. There were still cast members still carrying the scene on all the way out into the audience. So that was a little bit of of my experience. Do I have time to show a couple of images or not? No? Okay. I have yes. 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 yes, yes, yes. Okay, I'll be here real quick, I'm sorry. Yes. I have like 10 to 10 quick cycles. Yes. So this is a slave picking pot, and there's a thousand year old Sally Hemmings who sits at the mouth of the Jefferson Memorial to determine who's, who has presidential wife, because she knows. Mm -hmm. And then you see the forefathers at the top. Those. This is the white family. The twin brothers, Smith and Wesson, one is played by a black. So we have a lot of racial and racial in, in the cast. And that's the mother. This is at the end of the play. And they're triumphant, and they, they sent the slaves down south. You can, this, we burned a cross. We opened on Good Friday in the Bible Belt, and we burned a cross. They told us we couldn't do it. We got the fire marshal from the whole state of Indiana to approve the process, and we burned a cross on Good Friday. And this is a, one of the last scenes when uh, they run out of all their, their presidential white was not proven. Sally took all her stuff that they had stolen. And they weren't Jefferson, so they were sent down south to pick and stripped of all their clothes. And here they are at the post office where they have to report for duty. <laughs> and here's uh, the, the, the son of the white, the dark son of the white family trying to scrub himself clean. The, uh, it's called zestfully clean. You're not fully really clean, this is zestfully clean. <laughs> And here's Juliet trying to escape, and the white mob has found her, stripped her naked, and are determining what they're going to do with her and move to the next one. And they take pictures, like all the good lynchings have pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next one is it. this is uh, Abraham Lincoln, whose slave is asking, Am I free too? And he's going, Hell no. <laughs> And then uh, one of the, the one of the tangent scenes was a doctor professor. They had been capturing black men all over it since now they were slaves. And auctioning some of the good ones off again. And he was a doctor professor who had gone crazy, like someone like the sniper guy, and had found himself in prison. So the men in prison were pulled at auction on Sunday. <laughs> so he was auctioned along with the electric chair to keep him in line. And, and uh, this is the football player who played Ruth. Petitioning and Ruth eventually at the end of the play makes a deal with the Native Americans. And here's our president. It was the eve of Obama's 2008 in May when people were just figuring out that Obama just might be a contender. And so I decided that the president in the future should not be white. And we ended up with a Chinese president. And he chose to talk to himself. <laughs> by Walmart to pick that new cotton. <laughs> and then here are the people lined up to get presidential white. You see Obama there, and Colin Powell is there, and Whoopi Goldberg is there. And I never knew from night to night who's going to show up, and I think some white folks showed up and Donald and ended up in the line. Christine Aguilera was there. And one night I looked up and I was in the line. They had made a match with me and put me in the line for presidential white. And the, and the backdrop is inspired by banks and has this uh, uh, corporate money structure because part of the play's uh, premise is that it's the corporation, the economics that really become the divisive factor in, in, in this country at a lot of times. Thank you so much. Yeah.
oriented to peaceful cooperation steps. Yeah. And it was a very cross-cultural story. In, in, yeah, there were Klansmen, I later found out, they didn't tell me at the time, but at post-production, the, post there were grandsons of Klansmen who sent me letters, I have a couple of them, that thanked me for putting them in the room with, the, with black people and forcing them to look at their history. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Um, so our speaker, and um, it looks like we're going to wrap up with um, our final speaker, Philip Kondratanda. Uh, who is artist in residence at UC Berkeley, teaches playwriting there. He's a working playwright and one of uh, really one of the, the seminal artists in the American theater today. We're so grateful to have you here. Well, that's a hard act to follow. <laughs> I will try. Um, my area of interest has been, or one of my areas of interest has been the intersectionality of groups in America, communities, when they rub up against each other. Um, my hope is that what I'm going to talk about has resonance, has relevance to the, to, to the bigger issues and bigger themes of the conference. That's my hope. Um, one of my earliest uh, investigations was this idea of an interracial marriage. This was prompted by having friends who were biracial, whose mothers were Japanese, whose fathers were American GIs, African American. And um, I decided to write a play about that. This was about 20 years ago. And if you could put the slide up. Uh, this slide is a picture of a, a local jazz musician, Anthony Brown, and his parents. This is a gorgeous photograph. And that's, that's been used as kind of a a front piece for the play. And just in that photograph alone, you get a sense of so many things happening in it. Um, what I'm working on right now is a play um, where I'm taking The Wash. It's an old play of mine, an old kind of family play about a Japanese American family. And I've always been interested in, in adapting that to a, another family of color. So it's a classic kind of, it's a Japanese American play. Um, and I, I asked the question of, when is a classic a classic? In that you can adapt classics and it, it's okay. Um, and I thought, well, why can't the family of color be a classic? And then why can't if I adapt it, instead of going to the center, rather find a community group uh, that's also, quote, on the margins, and adapt, and adapt it in that fashion, and what might we come up with? So, um, I was able to uh, talk to Stephen Anthony Jones, who runs the Lorraine Hansberry Theater, and this is something I've wanted to do for a while, so we're going to adapt that play, The Wash, a Japanese-American family, straightforward play, uh, to a Jamaican-American family. And, of course, the idea is, you, you have to think through and you have to sit down and figure out what is the, the continuity, what is similar at the core in some way that allows this work to, to function authentically. So that will be taking place and uh, I found that the EGIS is going to be involved in the workshop we're going to be doing with ACT. Uh, and then finally, I thought I'd talk about a play called After the War. This was a play that I did um, at ACT about six years ago. And I, you can begin the slides. Maybe you have already. We'll just kind of plow through them. What interested me was to look at a moment in history and see if there were a moment where there was this moment of intersectionality of two communities where they were on, as it was talked about before, they're both on the margins, and yet there was an equitable footing. Uh, the period I looked into, which is an interesting period, was post-World War II, in uh, around 47, in San Francisco, in the Western Addition Districts, and uh, the Japantown District. They, they were side by side. What happened in the war, is the Japanese Americans were incarcerated. They left. In the interim, African Americans and other marginalized peoples in Western Addition and Fillmore District 
uh, naturally moved over and inhabited what was formerly Japan town. With them, they brought this vibrant jazz blues thing. So you had Japanese restaurants that were now, you know, uh, a nightclub featuring some of the top names in jazz and blues. This also happened in LA and Brownsville. But it, so the Japanese Americans get out of being incarcerated, they come back home, and they want their neighborhood back. And this is that moment when I thought, this is an interesting time to be. Japanese Americans, at this moment, are truly disenfranchised. They've just been put in prison. They don't know if they're Americans, they don't know if they want to be Americans. And then African Americans at this time, again, making sweeping generalizations. You know, they were, some of them had been working and come in uh, to the Bay Area to work on the docks, building ships. Uh, GIs were coming home. GIs were finding that, you know, they were still treated exactly the same after they'd given up their lives. Uh, they, they weren't buried in cemeteries, the white cemeteries. Uh, the workers, the dock workers, were already losing their jobs. And um, there was a, a, dis a kind of unrest that was going on in the community. So I thought what I'd like to do is set up a board, there's a boarding house in which uh, this Japanese American man has come home to take over. And it's populated at this point in time with African Americans, uh, poor whites from the South, uh, a Russian Jew has come by way of Yokohama, yeah. and, uh, uh, and Japanese Americans. And so the protagonist is asked by his own community to take the community back, it should be Japanese American. Um, at the same time, Chet made good friends with Earl Worthy, an African American fellow who's, who's been inside this boarding house. And Chet is an ex-jazz musician. And at that time period, jazz was segregated. So Chet has been playing with black groups, but he can't play with white groups. So as a consequence, he has familiarity sort of with, with the culture. And so for him to have to make a choice that he's supposed to kick out African Americans uh, and bring in Japanese Americans uh, cuts to the core. 10 minutes? Okay. Uh, it builds up a great deal of conflict. Um, what I found is, in writing these scenes, what's really tricky is uh, how to have two characters, uh, let's say, in the different communities, interact and speak in a way that is truthful, that is that is not trying to skirt issues, that is that gets to the point uh, in areas that's dangerous, which you have to go to when you sort of discuss racial interracial issues, I believe. And so you know I try to find you had to find for me I'm not African American. So how was I to write a character that's African American and give it its full due? So what it meant is workshopping a great deal, working with black directors, uh, black actors, doing my homework, uh, and trying to find sort of the, the major kind of wound, the center of the characters. In a situation where, again, one doesn't have power over the other. Each feels entitled to that area, contested area. And what happens in that situation when you put them at odds? What kind of conversation would they have? Uh, that is why, uh, that's what I attempted to do in After the War. And at this point, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have invite up uh, some actors who are going to read some, a scene, two scenes, from the play. So I'd like to invite up, uh, I'm going to get the names. <laughs> Leontine Mbele Mbong and Peter Callender, and they're going to read a scene in which uh, Peter is going to play uh, Earl Worthing, and Liam T is going to play his sister-in-law who's visiting at the sporting house, and they're having this, this discussion about uh, the Japanese American characters at the sporting house. This feels like home. I like it, Leona. I like it. This 
Amen. When I have more time, I'll pick up some collards for you. Mm. Well, I hear they're hiring down at St. Pedro, thinking maybe I'll go down there and see what's going on. Maybe you could see after Bernice if I do. You're not going to let them force us out, are you? They can't. As long as we pay the rent, they can't kick us out. We were here before them, and then they get let out and come back here and force all us colored folk out. No, sir. It's not going to happen. And they can't charge us, charge us more for me staying here. I talked to Mr. Moncawa and told him. You talked to Chet? I checked with the Tarokas, and they, he didn't charge them for their nephew, so they can't charge us. We talked a little. I wish you hadn't have done that. What? Someone's got to talk to them. You won't. I said I would take care of it. See, they was here before us. They was, Leon. All over here, up and down Webster and Fillmore, too. Even over South Park. Before the war, they owned the whole kit and caboodle. Just Japanese town, businesses, shops, houses. They got kicked out and put in those places way out there. And then they come back after they lose the war. And what happens? After they lose the war and we won, all us colored folks get thrown out and all these Japs get to move in. That's just like it always is, but that doesn't mean it's right. Uh-uh. We got a little girl to think of, and we shouldn't be moving all over. Don't call them Japs. They aren't Japanese. What are they then? Well, they are Japs, okay? <laughs> you could have fooled me. They speak Japanese, they eat Japanese, they look Japanese, they kick us out and move in Japanese. I think they're Japanese. They just got back from being locked you know, up. <laughs> they it doesn't matter, things like this. Everybody got pain they have to live with. Lord knows no one's got more pain than colored folk. That includes your Jap Oriental friends. So they've been locked up for three or four years. So what? That ain't pain. I got a lifetime of pain. Three, four years, that's a walk in the woods compared to our pain. Japs don't know nothing Leona, about pain. You can think and feel anything you want. But when it comes to this place, you don't say that word. Just like them fools out front of the fishbowl yelling things at Chet. All this is none of your business anyway. You just visit. Visit it? I can take care of Bernice myself. How are you going to do that? You don't even have a job. I took care of her before. I can do it now. Yeah, but Bessie's back in Mississippi and you left with Bernice. Okay, now let's not talk about Bessie, okay? She always was no good. Ever since we were little girls, and she always had an eye for the boys. All the boys, that's the problem. So she a little pretty. She has the morals of a stray cat. Boys always like that when a girl's a little light-skinned, no matter if she act like that's a That's enough, Leo. Why do you defend her? She run off on you and your little girl. Well, didn't she? Shut up. Please. Now, I heard enough. This is my place. She is my wife. She run off on me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one more scene with Leontine and Idris. Thank you very much. Again, this is a cold reading. They volunteered to do this. I'm very thankful that they're willing to get up here. And then this is um, the end. So this is a scene between Idris, who is playing a Japanese-American woman, and Leontine, who's going to continue to play Leona. Uh, and Leona, uh, Leona has come to uh, bring the money that's due for the rent. See how I wrapped it in clean paper? Chris knew bills, had to go down to the bank to get them. Mrs. Taroka explained things to me. Your ways aren't so special, folks can't understand. Oh, all right, well. Aren't you going to count it? I wasn't. Thank you. Yes, you were. Just going to wait till, I, till you close the door. Think somehow that'll spare my feelings. I don't understand you people. I know what you're going to do. You know what you're going to do. So do it. Don't worry about me. Go ahead and count it. It's for this month's rent. I picked up odd jobs. What about the last two months? Last two months? I guess we'll have to talk about that, find a common solution. What does Earl think? I can handle these matters. Yes, but Chester said we talked to Earl. Miss Okamura, 
I don't need a man to manage my affairs. Okay. All right. You said something when we came over to see television. Nothing wrong with just in case when it comes to a child. That talk about a child didn't go unnoticed. I got the feeling you might understand the situation we have here, you being so sensitive to a child's need. Bernice can't be without a place to stay. And with us being the only colored folks left at the boarding house when colored folks used to run the place, I think. Chester's family had to borrow money to get this place back. From coloreds. Mrs. Hitchens, we need the money. I see. Well, you really don't understand the situation. You think we're doing this because you're not Japanese. So it happens you're not. It's got nothing to do with us needing the rent. You don't know what I'm thinking. Believe me, you haven't a clue. Then tell me. Tell me, Mrs. Hitchens. You think it just happens to be that way. For colored folks, it can't be like that because when bad stuff happens, you don't just see what's happening to you right then. You see back to your mother, grandmother, great-grandmother. You got a memory of things don't even belong to you, but connected to you. And you know it didn't just happen. What happened before and now is all connected. I think I do understand, Mrs. Hitchens. Mrs. Hitchens, bad things have happened to us, too. No, no. <laughs> I've been through that with Earl. He got no sense what it means to be colored, and neither do you. And you have no sense of what it means to be Japanese in this country. You don't know about me. You don't know about me. I do know about you. You don't know about me. I listened to you. I gave you that courtesy, OK? We don't know each other. But we're under one roof now, and we both want the same thing. You want to pay the rent. I want you to pay the rent. I know you'll find a job. I'll find permanent work. And you can pay a little extra with each, each month until you make it up. That's the beginning. Yeah, maybe it is. Thank you. Thank you all for all your incredible contributions to today's panel. Unfortunately, because we have to set up for tech for Rooming Time 7, we have to move the conversations out to the lobby. Uh, it, it's